Every now and then, fate will step into the mound and throw one hell of a curveball at you. One day, you're an unemployed factory worker with 42 bucks in your bank account, and the next, you're strapping yourself into a Kevlar bodysuit and scooping up goblin shit with a dustpan. Yes, sir, life sure can be funny like that. As it turns out, none of the caretakers or their assistants use their real names at the zoo. The unwritten rule was that you couldn't choose your own pseudonym. Your name had to be chosen for you by the other caretakers. In the meantime, new recruits, such as myself, were known as Hey You, or more often, the others just ignored you. It was a decidedly frosty work environment, as Esmeralda eloquently summed it up. Nobody's going to give a shit about you until you prove that you're not a fuck-up. Till then, you don't have a name. She made a sweeping head-to-toe gesture at me and added, This doesn't help. None of this. I crossed my arms defensively and demanded to know what the heck that was supposed to mean. She rolled her eyes and snapped, Oh, come on, look at you. You look like a dollar store Kurt Cobain. You look like you rolled out of bed ten minutes before you left the house this morning. What did you have for breakfast today? A handful of Cheetos and a bong hit? Esmeralda wrinkled her nose in disdain and vigorously shook her head. I don't want someone like that watching my back. I want a partner who's tuned in. You know what I'm saying? I want someone who's got their shit together. Because if my partner doesn't have their shit together, maybe I won't go home that day. You get me? I muttered, yeah, well, sometimes appearances can be deceiving. And shuffled away with a dark cloud hanging over my head. I was angry at her but only because she was mostly correct in her assumptions, right down to the handful of Cheetos for breakfast. I vowed to choke back any extra bong hits or two the next morning, just to spite her. As the first week drifted by, I began to piece together a vague picture of Casimir's past. I learned that he'd once been a soldier, although he neglected to mention his rank, what branch of the military he served in, or even the name of the nation for which he'd performed his services, from what I could gather, Kaz had defected from the unidentified nation at some point and became a mercenary in a different country. I was dying to press him for more details, but I didn't quite dare. Suffice to say, it was a tough old buzzard with a checkered past, and that's all I needed to know for now. We made it a habit to take our lunch in the shade of a gazebo out in the gardens. It was my favorite part of the day because Clara and Jackalope would usually come nosing around for pets and treats. I would end every lunch break with an oversized rabbit stretched over my lap, her eyes closed in sheer bliss as I scratched that hard-to-reach spot between her antlers. On this particular day, which happened to be a Friday, Clara was in a decidedly feisty mood. She was thumping her hind leg and racing around the gazebo like a mad dervish, occasionally darting under the table to ram my shins with her antlers. This fun little game was leaving me with some decent bruises. After the tenth sneak attack, I leaned down and snarled. Stop it, you bad little shit! Hey Kaz, pass over that trank gun, would ya? Get in my ass beat. Kaz didn't reply, he just stared blankly at the remains of his lunch. Some kind of fish pastry that smelled almost as bad as gort. I waved my hand to get his attention and asked, Everything alright, man? You barely even touched your... squid and liver pie. Not that I blame you. Shit smells fucking horrible. Kaz shook his head and scrubbed his palms over his eyes. He lit a cigarette and sighed. Ah, I'm preoccupied. It's almost time for our turn in the midnight shift. I despise the midnight shift. I spied Clara sneaking in for another battering ram attack, so I scooped her up and attempted to subdue her with a hug. Settle your shit down. Why are you so wound up today? Sorry, what's this about a midnight shift? Why do we have to do a midnight shift? Kaz gave me a dour look and said, Beginning Sunday night, we'll spend a week caring for the creatures that are classified as other. These things are normally nocturnal in nature. Kaz clamped his lips together in a tight line. He blew twin plumes of smoke from his nostrils and added, During the day, another crew comes to clean the habitats while the creatures are at rest. We cannot do this at night when they are active. It is too dangerous. I scratched behind her ears and murmured, We don't like the sounds of that very much, do we, Clara? You and that rabbit, 
Kaz growled. It's almost sickening. I said, you're just jealous, and plopped Clara back down on the ground. Her ears swiveled around. She started sniffing the air. Her eyes bulged almost comically from their sockets. Clara's nose twitched, and she let out an explosive sneeze before abruptly whirling around to take off at top speed. She bounded over a clump of bushes in one frantic leap and disappeared from view in seconds. I watched her go and said, holy crap, she's wired today. You see that shit? Anyway, I guess it's time to get back to... I trailed off in mid-sentence. My train of thought had been completely derailed by the appearance of a tiny humanoid that was suddenly floating in the air between us, hovering a foot or so above the picnic table on iridescent wings. It looked like a cross between a hummingbird and a Barbie doll, perfectly proportioned and clothed in a tiny cloak made of milkweed fluff. It was maybe seven inches tall. A diminutive wisp of a creature with peppercorn eyes and a long flowing shock of silver hair. I licked my lips with a dry, clumsy tongue and wheezed. Hey man, what am I looking at right now? Holy shit. Kaz was leaning away from our unexpected visitor, as if he was trying to avoid the unwanted attention of a particularly aggressive bee. In a loud stage whisper, he said, This is a sprite. You'll be fine if you leave it alone. Ignore it. It will go away. The sprite drifted closer, its gossamer wings whirring away quietly as it hovered in the air. It appeared to be studying me with an unnerving intensity. I scooted as far away as possible on the bench and whispered back, it's looking at me, man. Why is it looking at me? It's freaking me out. In a thin, piping voice, the sprite litted, The midnight hour bringeth thou ill tidings. Death clings to thine shadow. Beware the one who walks in the moonlight. I did a double take and mumbled, Um, what? Excuse me? My strange little visitor waved its arms and chirped, Take heed of this warning. And remember, the light is close to thine heart. The sprite made a bizarre trilling sound and spun around in a circle. <laughs> I heard Kazimir gasp something in his native tongue and saw him make the sign of the cross in the corner of my eye. Faintly, I said, Hey man, what the hell's going on here? What should I do? Beware the one who walks in the moonlight. The sprite screeched, and it clapped its tiny hands together to emphasize the importance of the words... Take heed. The light is close to your heart. Your heart! The sprite's last word spiraled up into a high-pitched buzz that felt like an ice-cold spike in my frontal lobe. It peaked at an ear-piercing octave, and the sprite shot away in a sudden blur. It was there one second, gone the next, moving so rapidly it appeared to wink out of existence. I stared at Kaz for a moment, too stunned by what I had just seen to speak. Finally, I peeled my tongue off the roof of my mouth and grunted, What just happened? Up until this point, I was pretty sure Casimir possessed only three different facial expressions. Mildly annoyed, mildly amused, or a foreboding, non-existent, then strictly prohibited foolishness of any kind. So as you can imagine, I was a bit disturbed to see that Kaz looked genuinely shaken by the incident. He was gawking at me like I had just sprouted a second head. Kaz pointed at me and stammered, It spoke to you. I've never seen such a thing. Reluctantly, I asked, Is that bad? Maybe not, Kaz muttered, but maybe so. I rubbed my temples and groaned, What now, for Christ's sake? Well, Kaz said slowly, First, you must understand that the Fey folk must move very rapidly, much faster than any mortal being can imagine. Because they move so rapidly, they can travel in any direction. From their perspective, up and down is the same as yesterday and tomorrow. The laws of their physical world mean nothing to them. In the eyes of the Fae, we are hardly different from the willow tree, or the ant which crawls across the table, or even a blade of grass in the fields. We are slow and insignificant. It is a very rare occasion when a sprite will even notice a human being. It is... Kaz made a vague motion with his hands, his lips pursed beneath the salt and pepper ridge of his mustache. 
I swallowed down a lump in my throat and demanded, It's what, man? Spit it out! You're killing me over here! Kaz shrugged and said, Very well, then. When the Fae take interest in a mortal being, they will sometimes... take them away. This does not happen often, but it happens. I stared at him in horror and croaked, Take them away to where? Kaz shrugged again and lit another cigarette. He exhaled a roiling cloud of smoke and said, No one knows. No one has ever come back. Well, there you go! I exclaimed and I zipped up my cooler bag with an angry jerk that nearly ripped the tab off the zipper. No one's ever come back! Good stuff! Man, fuck this job! Kaz held up his finger in a shushing gesture and... In a conspiratorial tone of voice, he said, According to legends, they will sometimes predict the future. It may be wise to remember what it said this day. I was too busy being fucking dumbfounded to pay much attention, I snapped. I think it said something about the light being close to my heart. I don't know. I can't remember. Why the hell does Vic let these things fly around unsupervised anyway? Seems kind of reckless, doesn't it? Kaz explained that Victor actually had no control over the sprites or their actions. Unlike the rest of the creatures at the zoo, the sprites hadn't been captured out in the wild. They just sort of... showed up one day. And they never left. I said, really? That's weird. Wonder why. Kaz waved a hand at the mini castles and elaborate footbridges in the background. No one knows for sure why they chose this place, he said. I think the reason is obvious. If I was a fairy tale creature, I would wish to live in a fairy tale land. They were rival was in unexpected windfall for Victor. Sprites are very rare. I grunted, yeah, that's really wonderful for Vic, and I'm super happy for him. Listen, if I end up getting kidnapped by some Tinkerbell looking piece of shit, I'm gonna be pissed. Like for like for real. What kind of bullshit is that? Casimir's lips curled in a ghost of a smile, and he socked a playful punch to my arm. My entire arm went immediately numb. Perhaps they will tire of your constant complaining and bring you back. <laughs> I'm making a joke with you, boy. I think you'd be perfectly fine. He glanced down at his watch and grumbled, Lunchtime is over. It's time to attend to the goblin. I slung my cooler bag over my shoulder and murmured, Great. I think I'd rather get kidnapped. At the end of the day, I walked through the front entrance and almost walked right into Victor, who was chatting with the armed guards and slurping in a martini glass. Vic caught me by the arm and boom, Hey, you kid, how's it going? Well, your first week's officially in the bag. You're doing great in here. Keep up the good work. Right away, I knew something was up, and my stomach dropped into my shoes. It was obvious that Vic had been waiting for me. Now, don't get me wrong. I liked my new boss just fine, and all things considered, but I was also scared shitless of the man. There was something wild and unpredictable lurking behind Vic's cheerful grin, and his gaze was always just a little too sharp. It felt like he could bore right through my skull with that piercing stare and lay bare my most secret thoughts. I forced myself to meet his gaze and shirked, Thanks, Vic. I appreciate that. Uh, have a good weekend. I tried to scoot past him, but Vic stopped me dead on my tracks with a heavy hand on my shoulder. He gave it a firm squeeze and boom, in a hurry to get out of here, are you? Well, no, I I get it. You're young. It's the weekend. Got a wad of cash burning a hole in your pocket. Here, I'll walk you to your car. I didn't want to talk for a minute. Vic led me down the stairs, his hand still firmly gripping my upper arm. As soon as we were out of earshot of the guards, Vic said in a low voice, Look, I gotta admit, I'm a little worried about you starting the night shift. The exhibits we keep in that wing, they're, they're no joke. Not even alive, these things. Can you imagine that? Not even alive! In my mind's eye, the sprite gazed into my soul with its eyes, little flecks of obsidian, and trilled. You're the one who walks in the moonlight. I felt a stir of unease crawling its way down the length of my spine. Faintly, I said, not alive as in dead? Like ghosts and shit like that? Vic said, yeah, yeah, sure, we got a ghost in there. 
and I let out a harsh snort of involuntary laughter. It wasn't that I didn't believe him, of course. I just didn't want to believe him. The afterlife's a scary subject. Gort the Goblin was an obnoxious, disgusting frog monster, but he was still a living creature. The idea of encountering spirit world shit, like ghosts and ghouls, made my eyes start to involuntarily water. Vic glared at me and barked, What are you laughing at, kid? What do you think, I'm lying to you over here? The ghost is the least of your concerns in the wing of the zoo. Believe me, I don't know if you're ready for that kind of action just yet. Do you maybe want to stay where you are for another week or two? You'll be partnered with Esmeralda. I think she likes you. And let me tell you something. That lady, they don't like nobody. I shook my head and mumbled, I don't know, Vic. I think she actually kind of hates me. Look, if it's all the same to you, I'd just like to stay with Kaz. I'll be fine. I can handle it. Vic exclaimed, Hey, that's a spirit. But his eyes were troubled. We had reached my car at this point, and Vic leaned his bulk against the driver's side door, preventing my escape. He crossed his arms and said, hey, Listen up, kid. This is important. I mean, I got something locked up in that wing that really has it in for me, even, even more than the rest of them. You remember my story about the vampire? Yeah. Well, it's him. Long story short, he's got a long-standing grudge against me, as you can imagine. He'll probably tell you something about me that uh, just ain't true. <laughs> Lies, wild distortions of the truth, all that. Don't believe a word he says. I stood there a few moments in the bright sunshine, silently processing the fact that my boss was worried I might hear some mean-spirited gossip about him from a vampire. Faintly, I murmured, Okay, uh, thanks for the heads up. I won't listen to him. Vic looked relieved. He said, that's right. Don't listen to him and his bullshit. Honestly, I'd go pound a stake through this black lion heart right now. I still need that dirty little bastard around. As soon as I get a replacement for him, he's history. <laughs> Thing is, pretty hard to capture a vampire. That's the trouble with vampires, you know? It's easy to kill the ugly bastards and contain them. <laughs> and obey the laws of nature. I nodded enthusiastically and said, Oh, for sure. I, I bet you they're a handful. I made a show of hauling my keys out of my pocket and sighed. Anyway, I should kickstart this crazy weekend of mine. Vic heaved himself off my car and boom. Damn straight! <laughs> Ought to be young again. Chasing dames. Causing a ruckus, am I right? I flashed what I hoped was a devilish grin and chuckled. <laughs> I'll, I'll drink to that. In reality, my plan was to smoke a little hash, eat some Chinese takeout by a flickering light of the television. The truth was, I sort of hated going out to bars, and I wasn't much of a ladies' man. I mean, I was a decent-looking enough guy underneath all that hair, but I was really bad at talking to girls. I banished the gathering storm of self-pity and pushed past Vic's protruding gut, to hop into my car. Vic leaned into the window and said, Remember, that blood-sucking son of a bitch is completely full of shit. Don't believe a word he says, not one word. No, oh, and remember to wear the silver on your neck. It's really important, the silver. Don't forget. There was another awkward silence. I sat there and waited to be excused with a polite smile across my face. Anywho, Vic wheezed, you start on Sunday night at 11, and you're done on Friday morning. Listen to Casimir, you'll be fine, he knows his shit. Vic sent me on my way with a slap on the hood and cheerful, Go on, kid, get out of here! As I slouched in front of the TV later that night, stoned and mellow, I found myself wondering what kind of dirt a vampire with a gambling problem might have on a former contract killer. Then I pondered the true nature of a universe where one could find themselves exploring such a weird fucking scenario. And then I smoked some more hash and giggled at the TV for a while because fuck it, man. Fuck anything and everything under the sun. Nothing made sense anymore. I was simply going to have to live with that fact. I put down the hash pipe, called it a night when my eyelids started sliding shut. I paused at the window on my way back from the bathroom to have a peek at my silent watcher in the street. A burly shadow that leaned against a dark sedan and chain smoked all night. Vic had no shortage of large men working for him, but I was pretty sure that it was Len down there. 
even though I had the distinct impression that he didn't like me very much. I felt oddly comfortable that it was Len and not someone else. I felt like he was probably a decent guy at heart, despite what he did for a living. This is a job, I suppose. Everyone needs to make a buck in the world. That's how it is. Softly, I said, Good night, big guy. I left him to his midnight vigil. A hired killer who would shoot me dead if I gave even the slightest indication I might blow the whistle on Vic's operation. And you know what? I slept like a baby that night. Can't quite explain why, but knowing that Len was lurking outside on the street below gave me a warm, cozy feeling. In a strange way, I felt like we were all family now. Me, Len, Vic, Kaz, all the hired goons and the monsters in the habitats. We were all one big, dysfunctional family with a secret. And the whole situation was starting to grow on me. Day by day, it was starting to grow on me. My last coherent thought before I fell asleep was, I should order him a pizza. I had a strange hunch that Len was probably a lonely guy. I had no idea why, but I kind of liked the big galoot. I could sense that he was a victim of circumstance. I could relate all too well to that. Saturday flitted past in a blur of grocery shopping and laundry, followed by a long night of video games and bong rips. The latter was furnished by my dealer, a casual acquaintance named Vincent. Vincent was somewhere in his late forties, an aging hippie leftover, whose favorite topics were the man and the various methods through which the man was able to keep us down. Occasionally I'd let him hang out so that he could vent for a while, but more often I just did the deal at the door and immediately bid him good night. He was well, a bit much sometimes. A nice guy overall. But his paranoia shtick was definitely a bit much. As soon as I swung open the door, Vince blundered past me and blurted, Hey man, there's a dude lurking around in front of your building. Like, a dude, you know? One of them! I manufactured a skeptical grin and said, The fuck are you talking about, Vince? What dude? Vince peeked out the living room window and quickly ducked out of sight, plastering himself flat against the wall. He's down there. Vince whispered. He's sitting in a black sedan. This guy is pig stink all over him, man. Like, like he's practically oozing Ude Fascist establishment from his pores. That's how fucking obvious he is. What have you been getting yourself into, man? I'm not committing any federal crimes, Vince. Sit down. Stop freaking out. It's just some guy in his car. Just some guy in his car, Vince repeated, his tone incredulous. Sure, man, it's just a weird coincidence that a big gorilla in a dark suit staring up at your window out of all the windows in this whole city and heat. So what you got tonight? I interrupted. I'm looking for some decent green. Then I can help you, Vince sighed in mock regret, and he flopped himself down on my couch. See, all I got here is this fucking dynamite green. 70 for a quarter, 40 for a half. Don't ask for no grams, bro. I don't have that high school shit. What you want? I raised my eyebrow and shook my head at him. I said, I'm disappointed in you, Vince. I feel like you should be pointing a flintlock pistol and yelling, Stand and deliver, because that's highway robbery, man. Vince smirked. Go grow your own stone then, man. Smoke for free. Whatever, my man. Just sell me a quarter. Quit rubbing your hippie stink all over my fucking couch. Oh, come on, brother, Vince moaned. We're socializing here. What's gives? Why are you always so harsh, man? I warily scrubbed my palms over my face and grunted. Look, shoot me a quarter ounce. Get out of here, would you? I'm not in the mood for company. You're never in the mood for company, Vince grumbled. It's all good, though, man, because you know what? You're an asshole. There you go, asshole. Give me my money so I can stop burdening you with my presence. I saw Vince's wounded expression and almost felt bad for him. Vince was an old burnout, but he was a nice enough guy beneath the foggy brain dumb fuckery. He put the money on the coffee table and said, Look, we'll smoke one, hang out for a while next time. I promise, it's been a long week. I'm on my last nerve over here. Thanks for coming by, man. You know I appreciate it. Vince slouched over the door and muttered, Well, I certainly hope you appreciate it. There aren't many dealers out there who will deliver. You're one of a kind, Vince, I agreed. And I firmly steered him out the door. When he was gone, I let out a sigh of relief and sat down to roll a fat one. I was already regretting my offer to let him hang out next time. 
Vince was a nice guy, yes. But he was fucking exhausting. I was just about to light up when I heard a knock at the door. I groaned and stomped over to unlock the deadbolt, the joint still dangling from the corner of my mouth. As I opened the door, I started to ask, what'd you forget this time, Vince? And wham! A hand the size of a frying pan smacked in my face and shoved me across the room. I fell backwards with my arms pinwheeling for balance, the broken remains of my doobie raining from my lips as I fell over the coffee table. I ended up wedged into the narrow space between the table and the couch, my arms and legs waving up in the air as my nose trickled blood over my lips. I had time to gasp, what the fuck? And then I was plunged into shadows as a hulking figure loomed above me. I was roughly hauled from my feet and found myself standing face to face with Len, my watcher in the night. Len looked absolutely fucking furious. His entire head was flushed as red as a brick. Not just his face, his entire head, including his raging cauliflower ears. Len hauled me in close and growled, you got one chance, Dumbo, and only one. You lie to me, I'll throw you out the window, got it? I sniffed. Yeah, I got it. Len nodded in approval. Good. Who's the douchebag with the balding ponytail? It's my pot dealer, I whimpered. His name's Vincent. Vincent the pot dealer. Okay, sure. So what exactly do you and Vincent the pot dealer talk about this evening? Uh... Well, we talked about pot, and Len twisted my ear until I shrieked for mercy. He clamped my head between his hands, squashing my face into a strange goldfish shape, then barked, That's it, smart guy, you're going out the fucking window. I shrieked, No, wait, okay, okay. Uh, he, he saw you looking up at my window, he assumed you were a cop. He's a paranoid old hippie, so he always thinks that the man is out to get him. I told him that you were just some guy sitting in a car, and I changed the subject and left after that. Well, he's not wrong. Len said softly, and released his crushing grip on my head. The man is out to get everyone. Len shoved his hands into his pockets and had a look around my apartment. He turned back to me and gravely shook his head. He didn't have time to clean this weekend, or last week, for that matter. Don't look at the mess, and I assume that I... am not worried about your filthy crack shack, kid. Len snapped. He's the hippie. You gotta go. Hesitantly, I said, Where does he have to go? Len snorted in exasperation. He threw up his hands and rasped, To the big sleep, you fucking half-wit. He saw me, and that's not good. He's gotta go. I gawked at my unwelcome visitor with my mouth hanging open in shock. I tried to offer a rebuttal, but all I could think was a rapid-fire stream of shit, 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 shit. And that wasn't helpful at all. What? Len demanded. What you looking at me like that for? It's all your fault for having Mr. Nosy Pants over here in the first place. Look, I already know what's gonna happen. You guys are gonna get stoned some night. He'll ask about me again. You'll end up blabbing something you should have kept to yourself. Len shrugged at my horrified expression. He said, I gotta do what I gotta do, kid. Protecting Victor Bonicelli and his interests... It's my entire job description right there, and this hippie is a loose end waiting to unravel. He's a threat. Slowly, I said. Can't believe I'm in a position where I have to beg for my pot dealer's life. But here we are. Look, please, please don't do that, okay? Please, Vince is harmless. Even if he did know something, no one would ever believe him. He's a flake. He thinks the moon is a projection and cancer isn't real, for crying out loud. Uh, believe me, no one listens to Vince, and I would never, ever tell him or anyone else about the zoo. I swear it. Damn right you aren't going to tell anyone, Len agreed. Because if you do, I'll disappear, I interjected. I already heard this spiel from Vic. I don't particularly want to end up as pig feed, so don't worry. Okay, my lips are sealed. When people tell me not to worry... I start worrying, Len grated, and he turned to leave. As he was walking out the door, he looked back and said, Do us both a favor. Find yourself a new dealer. That's an order. I started to close the door behind him, but Len abruptly stepped back into view and barked, Hey, one more thing before I go. I flinched and reluctantly asked, What is it? With a twisting knot of dread in my stomach, Clean your apartment! He snarled. 
and he made a sweeping motion with his hand and all the clutter. This is a disgrace. Your mother should come over here and slap the shit out of you for living like this. Pick up your garbage, vacuum the carpet, scrub that disgusting table with some lemon pledge. You got a kitchen sink full of dirty dishes? Yeah, sure you do. Wash them, you lazy fuck. You want to get cockroaches or something? Jesus Christ, what a mess. Len gave my apartment one final look of revulsion and clomped away down the hall. I locked the door behind him and immediately started trembling from an overload of adrenaline. I, I leaned against the door and groaned. This job fucking sucks. Much later that night, as I was laying on the couch and blinking owlishly at the TV, I realized something that made me burrow deeper into the safety of my blanket. There's only one way Lynn could have known what Vince and I had been talking about. At some point during the past week, my apartment had been bugged. Monitoring my every move wasn't good enough for Vic Bonicelli's deepest ingrained paranoia. He was listening, too. The first thing I noticed as I pulled into the parking lot Saturday night was the sign on top of the building. It was the first time I'd ever seen it lit up at night, and it was nothing short of magnificent. The sign embodied Victor Bonicelli's personality almost perfectly. A dizzying blend of crass glamour and sinister joviality. It lit up the night with breathless promises of danger and excitement, a monolithic and jubilant celebration of all things curious and arcane. I parked my car and sat there for a couple of minutes, staring up at the sign in awe through my scratched-up windshield. It was the perfect blend of Las Vegas and the Twilight Zone. The second thing I noticed was the profusion of ultra-expensive vehicles, including several stretched limousines that were parked at the rear of the lot. I'd had a vague idea that the guests generally arrived after the caretakers were done for the day, but I'd never really given them any further consideration. Judging from the vehicles in the lot, they were all extremely wealthy. These people didn't just have money, they had fuck you money, and probably some more to spare. I walked through the glittering display of wealth and approached the armed guards at the entrance with a lump in my throat. The guards were an interchangeable roster of dead-eyed henchmen. None of them seemed to like me very much. I had the distinct impression that they were all eagerly waiting for the day when Victor would give them permission to shoot me. As I walked up the steps to the door, the guard on the left sneered, Look what the cat dragged in. The guard on the right smirked at me and added, Have fun with the spoofs tonight, kid. If you see any guests in the lobby, just keep on walking. They don't want to talk to you. And I muttered, Gotcha, no talking. And I brushed past them with my head down. I wanted to say something more along the lines of, go fuck yourself, you gorilla looking piece of shit, but it was obviously not a wise decision. I contented myself with giving them the finger behind their backs. Small victories and all that jazz, I suppose. The lobby was glowing with a mellow ambience of tasteful lighting and polished marble. I saw people standing around the statue of the Hydra, laughing and talking with animated hand movements. They looked like they were half out of their minds with excitement. I gave them a wide berth and headed for the entrance to the service tunnels. Kaz was already there, waiting for me with his arms folded across his chest. He eyed me sourly and grunted, Are you ready for a very different experience? Come, we must prepare. Kaz ushered me to the equipment room and started rummaging around in a storage closet that was labeled Other. He handed me a utility belt and said, Different jobs require different tools. When we work with the mortal creatures, we carry pepper spray and tranquilizer guns. None of those weapons will be of any use against the undead. I looked through all the pouches and found a strange array of items, including a small mirror, a bag of tobacco, a bunch of glass beads, and a plastic pistol that made sloshing sounds when it moved around. I asked, Is this a water gun? This kind of feels like a water gun. It's filled with a silver nitrate solution, Kaz explained, and he handed me a chain made of silver. He motioned to the changing rooms and said, You must wear this chain at all times. Do not take it off under any circumstances. The undead despise silver. Do you have any questions? I told him I had many questions, too many questions, and Kaz tilted his head in a slight nod. It can be difficult to understand, 
he agreed. Get changed. Please hurry. You arrive late. I would not bother with the chain mail tonight. It will not protect you. I massaged my temples against a looming headache and asked, You're shitting me, right? I mean, the Sasquatch and all the rest of them, like, that's still fucked up, but at least they're alive, you know what I mean? We're talking about life after death here. I don't know, man. You do not believe, so it must not be. You remind me of a boy from back in my village. We called him Foolish Oaf. He attempted to milk a bull and suffered a fatal kick to the skull. I raised my eyebrows and protested. How, how do I remind you of that guy? Did What the hell does that have to do with anything? Because Oaf was stupid. And so are you. No one was surprised when he died. Now do you see? Go get changed. Kaz brushed past me and stomped over to the changing room. I followed after him with my face flushed red with embarrassment. Each changing room door was marked with a nameplate, with one exception, of course. Mine still didn't have a nameplate. I was officially known by my co-workers as Hey You, or even worse, I was acknowledged with a look of disgust and stony silence. I briefly wondered if it would be funny to write some ridiculous name on the door myself, something goofy like Rock Hard Body or Flex Danger Hound, and a voice inside my head sneered, what the fuck's wrong with you, kid? It sounded suspiciously like Len, but I knew it was actually my own conscience telling me to grow the fuck up and start acting right. My job at the zoo wasn't a joke. It was a very real situation. Casimir, Vic, the monsters, the wiretaps in my apartment, all of it was very real. And I had to start taking it seriously right now. Ten minutes later, we were in the service tunnels. Kaz took me to the first door and tapped the observation window. He beckoned me to come take a look. I read the identification plate on the door and breathed. Oh man, that's rough. The plate said, Poltergeist, female, deceased, 1108-1874, age, seven years. Her name is Catherine, Kaz said. She was murdered in her own home. I peered through the reinforced glass and discovered that Catherine's habitat was a painstakingly accurate mock-up of a Victorian-era drawing room. The room was dimly illuminated by the stuttering flames of several kerosene lamps, creating a forest of wavering shadows amongst the dense cluster of furniture and knickknacks. This is where she died, Kaz murmured behind me. Victor purchased the house and hired workmen to take the room apart. Board by board, everything was cleaned and restored to its original condition, and the room was reassembled within the habitat. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary happening on the other side of the glass. I asked, is she invisible or something? There's nothing to see in there except for a bunch of antiques. All ghosts are invisible, Kaz retorted. This one can be seen in a mirror that's been equipped with a silver backing. She can also be detected on film. If you must enter her cell, keep track of her with the mirror on your belt at all times. She can be very hostile. It is best to remain cautious. I searched through the pouches on my belt to pull out a round, palm-sized mirror. I tilted it one way and saw nothing out of the ordinary, then tilted it the other and almost dropped the damn thing in shock. I cleared my throat and grunted. <clears throat> okay, there she is. Holy shit. Catherine was a diminutive scrap of a girl in a dark dress and a fancy hat, a ruffled little bonnet that was perched high atop her severed head. She was hugging her head to her chest with both arms. Her eyes were open, conscious, and horribly aware. I stepped back from the door and scrubbed my hands over my weary face, the night had barely begun, and I was already tired. I asked, How do you defend yourself against a poltergeist? You cannot. However, if you are watching her in the mirror, she is unlikely to approach you. I chuckled at this a little bit and said, Kind of like the ghosts in Super Mario Bros. 3. That's, that's wild. Kaz stared at me with a completely blank expression. Slowly he asked, what in the name of the heavens is Super Mario 3? 
What is this nonsense? I took another look into the habitat with the mirror and flinched. I said, never mind, let's just move on. She, uh, she's right on the other side of the door. She's holding her head up to the window so she can look at us. Man, I'm telling you something, okay? I'm not going in there. Kaz's lip twitched in a ghost of a smile, and he said, Ah, it's probably for the best. You would forget to keep track of her location and get smeared across the ceiling. Who do you think would be made to clean up that mess? I cast an uneasy glance at the overhead lights and murmured, You, hopefully. Kaz gave me a guarded smile and guided me down the corridor to the next habitat. It's time to meet the vampire. We stopped in front of the door and Kazimir grunted, this is it. This is the vampire. I looked through the window and saw a skinny little dude sitting by himself on a concrete floor. The walls were also bare and concrete. There wasn't a single stick of furniture in the whole room. The only features to be seen anywhere in the habitat were a great covered drain hole in the middle of the room and a hose reel that was attached to one of the walls. The guy sitting on the floor looked to be somewhat in his late thirties, Short and thin, pale as milk. His head was shaved to the scalp and he was clothed in some ragged-looking coveralls. He looked like a prisoner in a forced labor camp. His name is Salvatore, Kaz said, and he is very dangerous. He cannot approach you with a silver chain around your neck, but he has the power to influence your thoughts. Keep your side arm ready at all times when you enter this habitat and be aware of intrusive thoughts. I pulled my so-called sidearm from its holster and said, This is a squirt gun, Kaz. Like, it's it's literally a plastic squirt gun, man. What do you mean? What did you say was in here? Holy water? Holy water does nothing. That is a myth. Your weapon is filled with a silver nitrate solution. It has a strongly corrosive effect on the undead. So use it only if you must. Victor does not want the attraction to look unsightly for the guests. I holstered my squirt gun and resisted the urge to make a smart-ass comment. Instead, I pointed out how spare and dreary the vampire's habitat was in comparison to all the others, and asked, What's up with that? You know, it seems like it's kind of cruel and unusual punishment or something, doesn't it? Victor has a burning hatred for Salvatore. And that is all I care to say. It is not my concern. Neither is it yours. He gave me a stern look and made a quick zipping motion across his lips. The cameras were always watching. The microphones were always listening. And certain opinions were best left unspoken. A vampire can think, feel, and even breathe. But they are not alive. Remember to the likes of him. You are nothing more than a walking milkshake. I raised an inquisitive finger and asked, Speaking of which... How do we feed this guy? We're not sticking actual living people in there, right? Because I'm not okay with that. He feeds on nothing. He is not fed since he has arrived here, and that was many years ago. Vampires do not need human blood to live, because they are already dead. Their thirst is a symptom of their curse. I thought about that for a moment, and said, Let me in. I want to talk to the guy. Kaz arched an eyebrow. He said, Are you sure of this, boy? You may enter if you wish, but most of us prefer to stay out. It is an unnecessary risk. Salvatore is extremely dangerous. I examined Victor's shaven-headed penitent through the observation window, sitting there on the bare concrete floor of a starkly empty room, and I slowly nodded my head. Yeah. Let me in. I want to talk to this guy for a minute. Kaz punched the code without any further comment. There was a series of metallic clunks as the deadbolt drew back, and the door swung open with a soft, pneumatic hiss. As I turned to go inside, Kaz bent down close and breathed in my ear. Remember, they are always listening. Always be careful of what you say, even in habitats. Keep your weapon in hand, and make your conversation brief. Salvatore watched me through the door with his eyes narrowed in suspicion. We stared at each other for a while, both of us waiting for the other to speak. Finally, Salvatore clambered to his feet and rasped, Well, the fuck you want, kid? 
You want to take my picture or something? Don't bother, it won't work. Me, I don't really show up very good in pictures. I hesitated then. No, nothing like that. I just... wanted to talk. Salvatore gave me a disconcerting toothy grin and repeated, Talk. Sure. I'll talk your ear off. Should probably get rid of that chain, though. I don't like it. That thing, it's really heavy anyway, right? Heavy as shit kind of irritates the back of your neck, don't it? The chain was pretty heavy. He was right. I could feel it rubbing uncomfortably against the back of my neck. It was the stupidest accessory of a completely ridiculous costume. Cumbersome, itchy as well. I wanted nothing more than to rip it off and hurl it to the far corner of the room. I didn't really need it anyway, did I? Maybe... I suddenly became aware of the sharp intensity behind Salvatore's gaze. It reminded me of a house cat staring into a bird cage. All bright eyes and twitching tail. I shook the intrusive thoughts out of my head and pointed the business end of my water pistol at him. With a bravado I wasn't feeling at all, I barked, Don't try it! Stay out of my head! Keep your distance! Salvatore lifted his upper lip in a feral snarl, fully exposing his pointy canines. He hissed, Got ourselves a tough guy over here. Get out of my face, you gee whiz looking piece of shit. You ain't no tough guy. I can smell your fear. You got every right to be afraid, Billy Whitebread, because I'll rip into you the first chance I get. I'll splatter you all over these walls. I told him. I don't have to be a tough guy to pull the trigger. And squirted a dribble of gray-tinted liquid near his feet. Salvatore was already leaping away before the silver nitrate solution hit the floor. He sprang ten feet into the air, executed a tight backwards roll, and landed lightly on his feet. My mouth dropped open in amazement. His agility made the finest gymnast in the world seem like an infirm senior citizen in comparison. Sal gave me a sour nod and crossed his arms. Point taken, he grunted. Fine. What you want to talk about? Softly, I murmured. I want to talk about Victor Bonicelli. Keep it down, though, if you don't mind. They might be listening. Salvatore's eyes erupted in a blaze of old and abiding hatred. He stabbed a finger in the air and spat. Take it from Sally Two-Shoes. That fat fuck is a backstabbing two-faced snitch. He was planning to stab Jimmy Nichols in the back ever since he started running drops on his bicycle. A natural-born snake in the grass, that guy. A real sick fuck. I blinked in surprise and said, I didn't think you actually knew each other. Sal groaned. I was the one who vouched for that cocksucker. He never would have got it made if it weren't for my influence. No good deed goes unpunished, Billy. Nichols got off easy in comparison. A bullet to the back of the head. Away he went for his final rest, not me. This is what I got. This! Salvatore motioned at his stark surroundings and gave me a grim smile. This may come as a surprise to you, kid. But I didn't want to become a vampire. You know who did this to me? Victor. That's who. Bet you didn't know that, did ya? I did a double take and exclaimed, What? How? Sal shushed me and grunted, Keep your voice down, dummy. They're listening, remember? Anyhow, I'd always had this gut feeling that Vic was planning to get rid of Jimmy, take over the crew. I didn't have any concrete proof, but I could see it in his eyes, you know. I could see it in the way that he looked at Nichols when he thought nobody was paying attention. Now, I swear on my mother, I'd never breathe a word about my suspicions to a single soul. Not to the guys, not to a dame, not to nobody. But Vic is a fucking bloodhound. He could look right into your soul, that guy. I'm telling you right now, kid, you can't hide a secret from Victor Bonicelli. Anywho, one night, it's getting late. It's just me and the bartender down to the shores. Shores was a little hole in the wall down by the riverfront. Nichols bought it as a front back in the early 80s. 
kind of became our unofficial clubhouse over the years, you know? It was a safe place to talk business. Drinks were always on the house. Felt like you were among family when you were down at the shores. Felt like you were home. So Victor comes strolling in about an hour before closing time. He says, I'm glad you're here tonight, Sally. There's something I've been wanting to show you. Something special. He claps me on the shoulder like an old friend. He hollers over at the barkeep. Two glasses and a bottle of Johnny Walker over here. Let's go. Sal's lips curled over his fangs in a small, bitter smile. He shook a finger at me and said, should have known something was up. In my defense, I was already three sheets to the wind before we broke the seal on the whiskey. We sat there until that bartender. He might have been old. Gillespie Garbaldi. Was bartending that night. Can't remember. Anyway. Tells us he's got to lock up. Get home to his family. So we stagger out the door, drunk as fuck. Vic turns to me on the sidewalk, says... There's this cat house I visit sometimes. I'm telling you, Sally, it's something else. You gotta see this place. It'll literally knock you dead. The girls of this place are out of this world. Well, Salvatore mused, it wasn't no secret that I had a special weakness for the dames. Couldn't get enough of them. Should have known it would be the enemy someday. Anyhow, we get there. Right away, I'm saying... Hey, you sure about this place? Looks like a shithole. Ain't even a sign out front. Vic goes, nah, it's just a front. They don't want to draw any attention to their operation. It's real nice inside, real glitzy. Come on, I'll show you. So he grabs me and he steers my drunk ass through the door. We step inside. I immediately know I was fucked. Place is empty. No bar, no hot tubs, no broads. Just a big empty room with a pile of busted up drywall on the floor. It's an abandoned warehouse and I was fucked. Felt the barrel of a gun pressed into my back. Vic whispered in my ear, See too much, Sal. I love you like a brother. I always did. But you gotta go. I said, If you wanna kill me, why ain't I already dead? Should have pulled that trigger as soon as we stepped through that door. Victor kind of struggled with his words for a bit, you know, like he was conflicted about something. He says, I'm killing two birds with one stone, Sal. I need you gone, but I also have an obligation to fill. I'm combining the two and saving myself some hassle. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? He suddenly clocks me in the back of the head with the butt of his gun. Wham! I fall to the floor, he yells, come and get it. Sal trailed off, sullenly staring at the floor with his bony arms, still rigid, crossed over his chest. He whispered, They came out of the shadows. Dirty, horrible things dressed in rags. Crawling down the walls, across the ceiling. He jumped on me all at once, now I'm a vampire. Just like them. All I want is to die. Billy Whitebread. I just want to die, but I can't. He won't let me. I was at a loss for words. I searched for the right thing to say, but nothing would come to mind. Quietly, Salvatore said, Kill me, Billy boy. Smuggle in a crossbow, put a chunk of wood through my heart. I gasped at him in shock. I croaked, I can't do that. Vic would kill me. I'd kill you too if I could. I'd kill you and everyone you know. I'm a predator. I can't stop myself. I don't want to either. Better believe that. Kaz hammered sharply on the door with his fist, making me jump a little from the sudden racket. He rumbled over the intercom. It's long enough. It's time to go. Sal threw his hands in the air and yelled, Hold your fucking horses for a minute, Grobachev! Get all fucking night! I glanced back at Kazimir's scowling face. I told Sal that it was time for me to go. I ventured, maybe we'll talk again sometime soon. And Sal answered with a non-committal shrug. He tilted his head at the door and made a shooing gesture with his hands. Yeah, maybe. Get out of here, Billy. Comrade Boris. Starting to get restless. 
And don't turn your back on me on your way out. Never turn your back on me. I'm starving over here. Salvatore pulled the coveralls tight around his body, and I grimaced at the rigid outlines of his ribs. I choked, holy Jesus. Sal bared his teeth in a feral smile. He made a big show of looking around the room, a hand shading his eyes as he pretended to squint into the distance. No, ain't no Jesus in here, Billy boy. Not here. Go on, get the fuck out. Smell of your blood's driving me nuts. I shuffled backwards to the exit and Saul watched me every step of the way, still smiling a savage smile. I'm not much of a gambler, but I'd bet a million dollars. He was thinking about how blissful it would be to rip me open and bathe in my blood. I'd take that bet any day. I stepped into the service tunnel and bounced off a wall of muscle in a dress shirt and garbadine slacks. It was Len. He didn't look very happy. He clamped his hand down around my arm and growled, Come on, we gotta do something. My heart lurched to my chest. I blinked up at him and said, Do what exactly? Something, that's what. You'll see. Come on, let's go. I tried to pull away from Len's machine-like grip on my arm and sputtered, I'm working a shift over here. Can't this wait? Len snorted, No, this can't wait. And started hauling me towards the exit. I twisted in his grasp and shot a pleading look at Casimir, who was standing back and watching Len kidnap me with his arms casually folded across his chest. He looked back at me with a blank stare and said, Esmeralda is coming to take your place for the rest of the night. Go with Len. Go on. Len grumbled, quick stalling, kid, and dragged me down the hall to the exit. I looked back at Kaz with eyes like saucers, but he was already headed for the next habitat. Len manhandled me back to the changing rooms. I asked if he could please tell me what the hell was going on, and I was ordered to shut the fuck up and get changed. When I was done, Len proceeded to shove me across the lobby and into the parking lot where I was roughly crammed into the back of a Lexus. Len crouched down beside the car so he could stare me in the eyes. He poked me in the chest with his finger and snapped, I'll tell you something. You're not my favorite person right now. You are the one single people I'm driving, just one. I'll reach back there and slap the shit out of you. No joke. Shut the hell up. We drove in silence for what seemed like a long time. The city receded behind us until it was reduced to a spray of twinkling lights in the distance. I had no idea what was going on, but it was pretty obvious I'd somehow gotten myself in deep shit. I concentrated on keeping my breathing steady and trying to stay calm. I was very worried about what was going to happen when we reached our destination. We ended up parked beside a cornfield in the middle of nowhere. Len ordered me to get out of the car and shoved the flashlight into my hand. He popped open the trunk and said, Go on. Take a look. I clicked the flashlight and stifled a scream. My pot dealer was curled into the trunk. And he was very dead. There was a hole in his left temple. His eyes were staring at nothing. Len nodded somberly and said, I was right after all. He had to go. He was working for the cops. I shook my head and clicked off the flashlight. I didn't want to look at the body anymore. It made me feel like I was going to pass out. I said, not a chance. There's, there's no way that he'd ever do that. I, I call bullshit. Yeah, he would. And no, it's not. Men countered. My sources are never wrong. Knowing things and taking care of things. That's what I do. That's my job. He prodded Vince's corpse and sneered. His lame brain sack of shit sold a quarter ounce of blow to an undercover cop. He was already on probation, so he was looking at some serious time. Easy Rider over here, he knew he wasn't going to do so good in prison. So he cut a deal. He got released. He was a snitch. I was stunned. The night was proving to be chock full of startling revelations. I could only shake my head and groan. No, are you sure? That, that can't be true. Len seized me by the front of my shirt and sputtered, Shut your dumb fucking face and listen, kid! This guy was wearing a wire for months. He was wearing it when you guys were talking about me the other night, and you bet your ass the cops were saying, Wait, who's this guy they're talking about? That's a problem, see, because my identity doesn't officially exist. Do you understand me? Len don't got no address. Len don't pay no taxes. Len don't fucking exist. The cops take a close look at me and they're going to haul me in and ask me some real hard questions. And that ain't fucking good. 
And then shoved me back. And I fell on my ass in the tall weeds that bordered the shoulder of the road. He shook his head at me in the dim moonlight and rasp. You dumb son of a bitch, you bring this kind of heat on me, on Victor Bonicelli! Yeah, you just shit the bed real good, didn't you, kid? So now you're gonna help me change the sheets. Did you drop that flashlight? Yeah? Find it. You're gonna need it. We dragged Vince out of the trunk and carried him deep in the cornfield. Glenn pushed the shovel in my hands and watched me dig a hole between the rows. Make it good and deep, he ordered. Deep enough so the farmer ain't gonna snag something when he drives over him with a plow. This is gonna be Sergeant Pepper's final resting place, so do it right. Digging a grave is hard work, especially when you're getting berated the entire time by a gigantic man who kills other people for a living. By the time I'd finished filling it in and smothering down the dirt, the sky was beginning to get lighter in the east. My arms felt like jelly. We rode back to the zoo in silence. When we rolled into the parking lot, the sun was just beginning to peek over the horizon. I squinted against the glare and knew that I'd never see another sunrise without thinking about the dull thud Vince's body had made when I rolled it into the hole. Sunrises were officially ruined forever. Len pulled up beside my car and strained to twist his bulk around in the driver's seat. He speared me with his hostile glare and said, Vic, you don't know about none of this. And if you were smart, you'll keep it that way. Because if he finds out, he won't think twice about getting rid of you. I saved your ass tonight, kid. I remember that. I cleared my throat and forced myself to say, Thank you. The words felt like ash on my tongue. Bitter and dry. Cops might come around asking you for a few questions. Gonna be mad that their snitch disappeared. Don't sweat it. They ain't got nothing on you that'd be worth their time. Tell them you ain't seen that guy since last Friday. That's it. They come back to take you in. Don't say shit. Call this number. Hang tight. Len handed me a business card. It read, Vincenzo Pompasino, attorney at law. Criminal defense, litigation, family law. Len tapped the card with a blunt fingertip for emphasis and said, Vinny the Pomp, he's a friend of ours. Call him if the fuzz gets you any hassle. He'll shut him up real quick. I nodded and started to say something asinine. Something like, I'm sorry I caused a ruckus or some stupid shit like that. But Len jabbed a finger at the door and said, Shut your shit hole and go, Dumbo. I already told you, I don't like you much right now. Get the hell out of my sight. He peeled away and left me standing there beside my Buick. Dirty, exhausted, and deeply disturbed. I saw that Casimir was watching me through the glass doors of the front entrance, but I didn't have the strength to stumble over there and answer his questions. Instead, I got in my car, I drove home, and immediately took a very hot shower. I pulled the curtains shut and dragged myself to bed, but even though I was tired right down to my soul, I couldn't get to sleep. I felt like, like I may never sleep again. I got out of bed and gathered up all my pipes, papers, grinders, and bongs, and I threw it all in the garbage. With great reluctance, I also flushed the rest of my weed down the toilet. As the buds spiraled down the bowl and disappeared from sight, I realized that I felt a little better. Not a lot, but a little bit. I felt that I might be able to sleep this time. Not because I wanted to, but because I had to be alert when I was on the job. I had to be tuned in, as Esmeralda had put it so I could become a valuable member of the team, and maybe, just maybe, I'd last long enough to earn myself a name. I would walk the walk, and I would dance the dance, and when it was time to make my move, no one would see it coming. But I couldn't think about that, not yet. It's too dangerous. I gathered these perilous thoughts into a tight ball, and I pushed them far beneath the surface, where no one would be able to see them lurking behind my plastic smile. In due time, I'd allow myself the luxury of creating a plan, but for now, I would have to hide in plain sight, a secret heretic in a land of zealots. One bad move, and I'd be gone. I said it out loud. I can wait a long time. 
and I stared up at the ceiling until exhaustion stole in and rolled me into slumber. Deep as the grave, and twice as dark. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Pasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you're listening on the podcast, then hey, thank you for subscribing to the podcast. If you're not watching on the podcast or watching on YouTube, I'd appreciate if you, if you subscribe to the YouTube, because both are... Both, both, both are very good. They're important to me. And as always, I want to give a huge thank you out to everybody who's out there on the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. And to everybody who's already a part of it and even giving just $1, thank you guys so much for making it possible for me to be able to continue to do this and even be able to get some exclusive stories that we only have here on the channel and you can't find anywhere else. So a big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Adam Morris, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke369, Michael McIver, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Esteban, Braden Morris, Nate Cole, Horror Fan1212, Our Insect Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochy Boochies, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxinum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Cato Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob, the Rob Like Sharp Thing, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goreng Trimagasy, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tully Sue, William King, David Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Suzaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welvert, Here with Law, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. My goodness, the list is getting long. <gasps> but hey, I appreciate all of you. And everybody down in the description, and everybody who's a part of the Patreon, period. Thank you guys so much for making this happen, for getting treats for Hercules and Hylas, and helping me keep the lights on around here. And to everybody who watches and subs and likes and leaves comments and does all those things, sweet dreams.